This is Storm of Steel by Ernst Junger. For the Fallen. Chapter 1. In the Chalk Trenches of Champagne. The train stopped at Bazancourt, a small town in Champagne, and we got out. Full of awe and incredulity, we listened to the slow grinding pulse of the front, a rhythm we were to become mighty familiar with over the years. The white ball of a shrapnel shell melted far off, suffusing the grey December sky. The breath of battle blew across to us, and we shuddered. Did we sense that almost all of us, some sooner, some later, were to be consumed by it, on days when the dark grumbling yonder would crash over our heads like an incessant thunder? We had come from lecture halls, school desks, and factory workbenches, and over the brief weeks of training, we had bonded together into one large and enthusiastic group. Grown up in an age of security, we shared a yearning for danger, for the experience of the extraordinary. We were enraptured by war. We had set out in a rain of flowers, in a drunken atmosphere of blood and roses. Surely the war had to supply us with what we wanted. The great, the overwhelming, the hallowed experience. We thought of it as manly, as action, a merry dueling party on flowered, blood-bedewed meadows. No finer death in all the world than... Anything to participate, not to have to stay at home. Form up by platoon. Our heated fantasies cooled down on the march through the claggy soil of Champagne. Knapsacks, munition belts, and rifles hung round our necks like lead weights. Ease up, keep up at the back. Finally, we reached Orainville, one of the typical hamlets of the region, and the designated base for the 73rd Rifles. A group of 50 brick and limestone houses grouped around a chateau in Parkland. Used as we were to the order of cities, the higgledy-piggledy life on the village streets struck us as exotic. We saw only a few ragged, shy civilians. Everywhere else, soldiers in worn and tattered tunics, with faces weather-beaten and often with a heavy growth of beard, strolling along at a slow pace, or standing in little clusters in doorways, watching our arrival with ribald remarks. In a gateway there was a glowing field kitchen, smelling of pea soup, surrounded by men jingling their mess tins as they waited to eat. It seemed that, if anything, life was a little slower and duller here, an impression strengthened by the evidence of dilapidation in the village. We spent our first night in a vast barn, and in the morning were paraded before the regimental adjutant, First Lieutenant von Brixen, in the courtyard of the chateau. I was assigned to the Ninth Company. Our first day of war was not to pass without making a decisive impression on us. We were sitting over breakfast in the school where we were quartered. Suddenly there was a series of dull concussions, and all the soldiers rushed out of the houses towards the entrance of the village. We followed suit, but not really knowing why. Again there was a curious fluttering and whooshing sound over our heads followed by a sudden, violent explosion. I was amazed at the way the men around me seemed to cower while running at full pelt, as though under some frightful threat. The whole thing struck me as faintly ridiculous, in the way of seeing people doing things one doesn't properly understand. Immediately afterwards, groups of dark figures emerged onto the empty village street, carrying black bundles on canvas stretchers or firemen's lifts of their folded hands. I stared with a queasy feeling of unreality at a blood-spattered form with a strangely contorted leg hanging loosely down, wailing, help, help, as if sudden death still had him by the throat. He was carried into a building with a red cross flag draped over the doorway. What was that about? War had shown its claws and stripped off its mask of coziness. It was all so strange, so impersonal. We had barely begun to think about the enemy, that mysterious, treacherous being, somewhere. This event, so far beyond anything we had experienced, made such a powerful impression on us that it was difficult to understand what had happened. It was like a ghostly manifestation in broad daylight. A shell had burst high up over the chateau entrance and had hurled a cloud of stone and debris into the gateway just as the occupants, alerted by the first shots, were rushing out. 
There were thirteen fatalities, including Gebhardt, the music master, whom I remembered well from the promenade concerts in Hanover. A tethered horse had had a keener sense of the approaching danger than the men, and had broken free a few seconds before, and galloped into the courtyard, where it remained unhurt. Even though the shelling could recommence at any point, I felt irresistibly drawn to the sight of the calamity. Next to the spot where the shell had hit dangled a little sign where some wag had written, Ordnance this way. The castle was clearly felt to be a dangerous place. The road was reddened with pools of gore. Riddled helmets and sword belts lay around. The heavy iron chateau gate was shredded and pierced by the impact of the explosive. The curbstone was spattered with blood. My eyes were drawn to the place as if by a magnet and a profound change went through me. Talking to my comrades, I saw that the incident had rather blunted their enthusiasm for war. That it had also had an effect on me was instanced by numerous auditory hallucinations, so that I would mistake the trundling of a passing cart, say, for the ominous whirring of the deadly shell. This was something that was to accompany us all through the war, that habit of jumping at any sudden and unexpected noise. Whether it was a train clattering past, a book falling to the floor, or a shout in the middle of the night, on each occasion the heart would stop with a sense of mortal dread. It bore out the fact that for four years we lived in the shadow of death. The experience hit so hard in that dark country beyond consciousness that every time there was a break with the usual, the porter death would leap to the gates with hand upraised, like the figure above the dial on certain clock towers, who appears at the striking of the hour with scythe and hourglass. The evening of that same day brought the long-awaited moment of our moving, with full pack up to battle stations. The road took us through the ruins of the village of Betracor, looming spectrally out of the half-dark to the so-called pheasantry, an isolated forester's house buried in some pine woods where the regimental reserve was housed, of which, to this point, the Ninth Company had formed a part. Their commander was Lieutenant Brahms. We were welcomed, divided up into platoons, and before long found ourselves in the society of bearded, mud-daubed fellows, who greeted us with a kind of ironic benevolence. They asked us how things were back in Hanover, and whether the war might not be over soon. Then the conversation turned, with us all listening avidly, to short statements about earthworks, field kitchens, stretches of trench, shell bombardment, and other aspects of stationary warfare. After a little while, a shout rang out in front of our cottage-like billet to turn out. We formed up into our platoons, and on the order of load and safety, we felt a little twinge of arousal as we rammed clips of live ammunition into our magazines. Then silent progress, in Indian file, through the landscape daubed with dark patches of forest to the front. Isolated shots rang out from time to time, or a rocket flared up with a hiss to leave us in deeper darkness following its short spectral flash. Monotonous clink of rifles and field shovels, punctuated by the warning cry, watch it, barbed wire. Then a sudden jingling crash and a man swearing, damn it, why couldn't you tell me there's a crater? A corporal shuts him up. Pipe down, for Christ's sake. Do you think the French are wearing earplugs? More rapid progress. The uncertain night, the flickering of flares, and the slow crackling of rifle fire produce a kind of subdued excitement that keeps us strangely on our toes. From time to time, a stray bullet winds past chilly into the distance. How often since that first time I've gone up to the line through dead scenery in that strange mood of melancholy exultation. At last, we dropped into one of the communication trenches that wound their way through the night like white snakes to the front. There, I found myself standing between a couple of traverses, lonely and shivering, staring hard into a line of pines in front of the trench, where my imagination conjured up all sorts of shadowy figures while the occasional stray bullet slapped into the boughs and somersaulted down with a whistle. The only diversion in this seemingly endless time was being collected by an older comrade, 
and trotting off together down a long, narrow passage to an advanced sentry post, where, once again, it was our job to gaze out into the terrain in front. I was given a couple hours to try to find an exhausted sleep in a bare chalk dugout. When the sky lightened, I was pale and clay daubed, and so was everyone else. I felt I had lived this sort of mole's life for many months already. The regiment had taken up a position, winding through the chalky champagne soil, facing the village of Legoda. On the right, it abutted a tattered area of woodland, the so-called Shell Wood, and from there it zigzagged across vast sugar beet fields, where we could see the luminous red trousers of dead French attackers dotted about, to the course of a stream across which communications with the 74th Regiment were kept open by patrols at night. The stream poured over the weir of a destroyed mill ringed by brooding trees. For months, its water had been laving the black parchment faces of the dead of a French colonial regiment. An eerie place, especially at night, when the moon cast moving shadows through breaks in the clouds and the sounds of the rushes and the murmuring water were joined by others less easily accounted for. The regimen was taxing, beginning at dusk, for which the entire complement was made to stand to in the trench. Between ten at night and six in the morning, only two men from each platoon were allowed to sleep at a time, which meant that we got two hours of sleep a night each, though they were eaten into by being woken early, having to fetch straw and other occupations, so that there were only a few minutes left, as a rule. Guard duty was either in the trench, or else in one of the numerous forward posts that were connected to the line by long, buried saps, a type of insurance that was later given up because of their exposed position. The endless, exhausting spells of sentry duty were bearable so long as the weather happened to be fine, or even frosty, but it became torture once the rain set in in January. Once the wet had saturated the canvas sheeting overhead, and your coat and uniform, and trickled down your body for hours on end, you got into a mood that nothing could lighten, not even the sound of the splashing feet of the man coming towards you to relieve you. Dawn lit exhausted, clay-smeared figures who, pale and with teeth chattering, flung themselves down on the moldy straw of their dripping dugouts. Those dugouts... They were holes hacked into the chalk, facing the trench, roofed over with boards and a few shovelfuls of earth. If it had been raining, they would drip for days afterwards. A desperate waggishness kitted them out with names like Stalactite Cavern or Men's Public Baths and other such. If several men wanted to rest at the same time, they had no option but to stick their legs out into the trench, where anyone passing by was bound to trip over them. In the circumstances, there was not much chance of sleep in the daytime either. Besides, we had two hours of sentry duty in the day as well, as well as having to make running repairs to the trench, go for food, coffee, water, and whatever else. Clearly, this unaccustomed type of existence hit us hard, especially since most of us had only had a nodding acquaintance with real work. Furthermore, we were not received out here with open arms, as we'd expected. The old stagers took every opportunity to pull our legs, and every tedious or unexpected assignment was put the way of us as war wantons. That instinct, which had survived the switch from barracks yard to war, and which did nothing to improve our mood, ceased after the first battle we fought in side by side, after which we saw ourselves as old stagers. The period in which the company lay in reserve was not much cosier. We dwelt in fir branch camouflaged earth huts around the pheasantry, or in the hiller copse, whose dungy floors at least gave off a pleasant, fermenting warmth. Sometimes, though, you would wake up lying in several inches of water, although Roomy Dizzy was just a name to me. After only a few nights of this involuntary immersion, I felt pain in every one of my joints. I dreamed of iron balls trundling up and down my limbs. Nights here were not for sleeping either, but were used to deepen the many communication trenches. In total darkness, if the French flares happened not to be lighting us up, 
We had to stick to the heels of the man in front with somnambulistic confidence if we weren't to lose ourselves altogether, and we spent hours traipsing around the labyrinthine network of trenches. At least the digging was easy. Only a thin layer of clay or loam covered the mighty thickness of chalk, which was easily cut by the pickaxe. Sometimes green sparks would fly up if the steel had encountered one of the fist-sized iron pyrite crystals that were sprinkled throughout the soft stone. These consisted of many little cubes clustered together and, once cut open, had a streakily goldy gleam. A little ray of sunshine in all this monotony was the nightly arrival of the field kitchen in the corner of the hiller copse. When the cauldron was opened, it would release a delicious aroma of peas with ham or some other wonder. Even here, though, there was a dark side, the dried vegetables, called wire entanglements or damaged crops by disappointed gourmets. In my diary entry for the 6th of January, I even find the irate note. In the evening, the field kitchen comes teetering up with some god-awful pig swill, probably frozen beets boiled up. On the 14th, by contrast, delicious pea soup, four heavenly portions, till we groaned with satisfaction. We staged eating contests and argued about the most favorable position. I contended that it was standing up. There were liberal helpings of a pale red brandy, which had a strong taste of methylated spirits, but wasn't to be sneezed at in the cold, wet weather. We drank it out of our mess tin lids. The tobacco was similarly strong and also plentiful. The image of the soldier that remains with me from those days is that of the sentry with his spiked gray helmet, fists buried in the pockets of his greatcoat, standing behind the shooting slit, blowing pipe smoke over his rifle butt. Most pleasant were days off in a rainville, which were spent catching up on sleep, cleaning our clothes and gear, and drilling. The company was put into a vast barn that had only a couple of hen-roost ladders to facilitate entrances and exits. Although it was still full of straw, there were braziers lit in it. One night I rolled up against one, and was woken only by the efforts of several comrades pouring water over me. I was horrified to see that the back of my uniform was badly charred, and for some time to come I had to go around in what bore a passing resemblance to a pair of tails. After only a short time with the regiment, we had become thoroughly disillusioned. Instead of the danger we'd hoped for, we had been given dirt, work, and sleepless nights, getting through which required heroism of a sort, but hardly what we had in mind. Worse still was the boredom, which is still more enervating for the soldier than the proximity of death. We pinned our hopes on an attack, but we had picked a most unfavorable moment to join the front, because all movement had stopped. Even small-scale tactical initiatives were laid to rest as the trenches became more elaborate and the defensive fire more destructive. Only a few weeks before our arrival, a single company had risked one of these localized attacks over a few hundred yards, following a perfunctory artillery barrage. The French had simply picked them off, as on a shooting range, and only a handful had got as far as the enemy wire. The few survivors spent the rest of the day lying low, till darkness fell and they were able to crawl back to their starting point. A contributory factor in the chronic overtiring of the troops was the way that trench warfare, which demanded a different way of keeping one's strength up, was still a novel and unexpected phenomenon as far as the officer corps was concerned. The great number of sentries and the incessant trench digging were largely unnecessary, and even deleterious. It's not a question of the scale of the earthworks, but of the courage and condition of the men behind them. The ever deeper trenches might protect against the odd head wound, but it also made for a defensive and security conscious type of thinking, which we were loath to abandon later. Moreover, the demands made by the maintenance of the trenches were becoming ever more exorbitant. The most disagreeable contingency was the onset of thaw, which caused the frost cracked chalk facings of the trenches to disintegrate into a sludgy mess. Of course, we heard bullets whistling past our trench, and sometimes we got a few shells from the forts at Rhymes. But these little trifling reminders of war came a long way below our expectations. Even so, we were occasionally reminded of the deadly earnest that lurked behind this seemingly aimless business. 
On July 8th, for instance, a shell struck the pheasantry and killed our battalion adjutant, Lieutenant Schmidt. The officer in command of the French artillery was, apparently, also the owner of that hunting lodge. The artillery was still in an advanced position, just behind the front. There was even a field gun incorporated into the front line, rather inadequately concealed under tarpaulins. During a conversation I was having with the powder heads, I was surprised to notice that the whistling of rifle bullets bothered them much more than the crumps. That's just the way it is. The hazards of one's own line of service always seem more rational and less terrifying. On the stroke of midnight on the 27th of January, which is the birthday of Kaiser Wilhelm II, we gave the Kaiser three cheers, and all along the front sang Heil dir im Sieger Kanz. The French responded with rifle fire. Sometime, round about then, I had a disagreeable experience which might have brought my military career to a premature and somewhat inglorious end. The company was on the left of the line, and towards dawn, following a night on duty, a comrade and I were detailed to go on double sentry duty by the stream bed. On account of the cold, I had, in breach of regulations, wrapped a blanket around my head and was leaning against a tree, having set my rifle down in a bush next to me. On hearing a sudden noise behind me, I reached for my weapon, only to find it had disappeared. The duty officer had snuck up on me and taken it without my noticing. By way of punishment, he sent me, armed only with a pickaxe, towards the French posts about a hundred yards away. A cowboy's and Indian's notion that almost did it for me. For, during my bizarre punishment watch, a troop of three volunteers ventured forward through their wide reed bed, creating so much rustling that they were spotted right away by the French and came under fire. One of them, a man called Lang, was hit and never seen again. Since I was standing hard by, I got my share of the then-fashionable platoon salvos, so that the twigs of the willow tree I was standing next to were whipping around my ears. I gritted my teeth, and out of sheer cussedness, remained standing. As dusk fell, I was brought back to my unit. We were all mightily pleased when we learned that we would finally leave this position, and we celebrated our departure from Arrainville with a beery evening in the big barn. On the 4th of February, we marched back to Bazancourt, and a regiment of Saxons took our place. Chapter 2. From Bazancourt to Hatton Chatel. In Bazancourt, a dull little town in Champagne, the company was quartered in the school, which, as a result of our exceptional tidiness, soon came to resemble a peacetime barracks. There was an orderly sergeant, who woke everyone punctually, barracks duty, and roll call every evening, held by the corporal. In the morning, the companies moved out for a couple hours' brisk drill and exercise on the barren fields outside of town. I was taken out of this environment after a few days. My regiment was sending me on a training course to Recouvrance. Recouvrance was a remote little village, nestling in pretty chalk hills, to where all the regiments in the division dispatched a few of their young men to receive a thorough schooling in military matters from a staff of hand-picked officers and NCOs. We of the 73rd had cause to be grateful to Lieutenant Hoppe for this, and for much else besides. Life in this secluded hamlet was a strange mixture of barracks drill and academic lecture, attributable to the fact that the bulk of the participants had, until a few months before, been attending various lecture halls and faculties all over Germany. By day, the young people were honed into soldiers by all the rules of the art, while in the evenings, they and their teachers assembled around vast barrels brought over from the stores at Montcornet to display much the same degree of discipline and commitment to drinking. When the various units trickled back from their respective watering holes in the early hours, the little chalk village houses were treated to the unfamiliar sight of student hijinks. The course director, a captain, had the pedagogical habit of expecting redoubled efforts in class the following morning. On one occasion, we were even kept going for 48 hours straight. It was for the following reason. We had the respectful custom, at the end of a night's drinking, of giving our captain an escort home. One evening, an ungodly drunken fellow, who reminded me of Magister Lauchart, 
Editor's note, a debased version of a Renaissance man, 1758 to 1822, theologian, drunkard, soldier, and spy. He fought in the Prussian army against Napoleon, was captured in 1792, and in 1795 managed to escape and return to Germany. Was entrusted with this important task. He was back in next to no time, grinning widely and reporting that he had dropped the old man off, not in his billet, but in the cowshed. Our comeuppance was not slow to follow. Just as we had got back to our own quarters for a good lie-down, the alarm was raised by the local watch. Swearing, we buckled on our gear and ran to our stations. We found the captain already there, in a towering temper, as might be imagined, and displaying an extraordinary zeal. He greeted us with the call, Fire practice. The watch house is on fire. Before the eyes of the astonished villagers, the fire engine was trundled out of the fire station, the hose attached to it, and the guard room was inundated with well-aimed sprays of water. The old man stood on the stone steps with increasing ire, directing the exercise and calling on us for unstinting efforts. Every so often he bawled out some soldier or civilian who happened to provoke him especially, and gave orders for whoever it was to be led off. The unhappy fellow in question was quickly hauled off behind the building, safely out of sight. As dawn broke, we were still standing there, knees shaking, manning the pump. At last, we were allowed to dismiss, though only to get ready for morning drill. When we reached the drill ground, the old man was already there, clean-shaven, fresh, and alert, all ready to devote himself with particular zeal to our training. Relations between the men were very cordial. It was here that I made close friendships, which were to stand the test of many battlefields, with several outstanding fellows, among them Clement, who fell at Monchy, with the painter Tebe at Cambrai, and with the Steinforth brothers, who fell at the Somme. Three or four of us roomed together and shared a household. I particularly remember our regular scrambled egg and fried potato suppers. On Sundays we ran to rabbit, a local specialty, or chicken. As I was the one in charge of making the purchases, our landlady once showed me a number of vouchers or promissory notes she had received from soldiers re requisitioning food. A wonderful selection of earthly humor, generally to the effect that rifleman A. N. Other, having paid his homage to the charms of the daughter of the house, had needed a dozen eggs to help him recoup his strength. The villagers were quite astonished that we simple soldiers could all speak more or less fluent French. The circumstance gave rise to the occasional droll incident. Once, for instance, I was at the village barbers with Clement, when one of the waiting Frenchmen called out in his thick champagne accent to the barber, who was just shaving Clement, Why don't you just cut his throat with it? Complete with sawing motions at his throat. To his horror, Clement calmly replied, if it's all one to you, I'd just as soon hang on to it, showing the kind of sang-froid that a warrior ought to have. In mid-February, we of the 73rd felt consternation to hear of heavy losses taken by the regiment at Perth's, and felt desperate to be so far from our comrades at the time. The fierce defense of our sector of the front in that witch's cauldron got us the sobriquet the Lions of Perth's that was to accompany us wherever we went on the western front. Besides that, we were also known as Les Gibraltars, on account of the Brew Gibraltar colors that we wore in memory of the regiment from which we traced our descent, the Hanoverian Guards, who defended the island fortress against the French and Spanish from 1779 to 1783. The heavy news reached us in the middle of the night, as we were carousing as usual under the eye of Lieutenant Hoppe. One of the revelers, Beanpole Barons, the self-same man who had dropped the captain off to bed in the cowshed, wanted to walk out the instant he heard, because the beer had lost its taste. Hoppe held him back, observing that to do so would be unsoldierly, and Hoppe was right to. He himself fell a few weeks later at Les Eparges, in front of his company's extended line. On the 21st of March, following a little exam, we were returned to our regiment, which was once more at Bazancourt. Then, following a big parade and a valedictory address from General von Emich, we left the 10th Army Corps. 
on the 24th of March, we were put on trains and taken towards Brussels, where we were amalgamated with the 76th and the 164th regiments to form the 3rd Infantry Division, which is what we remained until the end of the war. Our battalion was billeted in the little town of Herines, set in a cosy Flemish landscape. On the 29th of March, I celebrated my 20th birthday. Although the Belgians had room enough in their houses, our company was installed in a large and drafty barn, which the cutting sea wind whistled through on the cold March nights. That apart, our stay in Herines was quite restorative, with plenty of drill, but good victualling, and the food also very cheap to buy. The half-Flemish, half-Walloon population was very friendly. I had frequent conversations with the owner of one particular estaminet, a keen socialist and free thinker of a distinctly Belgian type. On Easter Sunday, he invited me to lunch, and would take no money, even for what we drank. Before long, all of us had struck up our various friendships and relationships, and on our afternoons off we could be seen striding through the countryside, making for this or that farmstead, to take a seat in a sparkling clean kitchen round one of the low stoves, on whose round tops a big pot of coffee was kept going. We chatted away in a blend of Flemish and Lower Saxon. Towards the end of our stay, the weather improved, and we happily went for walks in the attractive, rather watery countryside. The landscape, in which yellow marsh marigolds seemed to have sprouted overnight, was set off by the sight of numbers of half-naked soldiers along the poplar-lined riverbanks, all with their shirts over their knees, busily hunting for lice. Fairly unscathed myself thus far by that scourge, I helped my comrade Pripke, an export from Hamburg, wrap his woolen waistcoat, as populous as once the garment of the adventurous Simplicissimus, editor's note, eponymous hero of the novel by Grimmelhausen, 1622 to 1676, a picaresque set during the Thirty Years' War. Round a heavy boulder, and for mass extermination, dunk it in the river, where, since we left Herines very suddenly, it will have mouldered away quietly ever since. On the 12th of April, 1915, we were put on trains at Hal, and, to mislead any possible spies, took a wide detour across the northern part of the front to the battlefield of Mars La Tour. In the village of Tronville, the company moved into its customary barn quarters, in a boring and squalid dump typical of the Lorraine, put together from flat-roofed, windowless stone crates. Because of the danger from aeroplanes, we were forced to stay in the crowded township most of the time. Once or twice, though, we managed to get to the renowned nearby sites of Mars La Tour and Gravelot. Only a few hundred yards away from the village, the road from Gravelot crossed the frontier, where a smashed French border marker lay on the ground. In the evenings, we sometimes took melancholy satisfaction from going on walks to Germany. Our barn was so ramshackle that you had to pick your way carefully over the joists if you weren't to crash through the moldy planking onto the threshing floor beneath. One evening, as our unit, under our decent Corporal Kerkhoff, was busy doling out portions on a manger, a huge lump of oak detached itself from the rafters and came crashing down. It was pure chance that it stuck fast a little way over our heads in the crook of two walls. We were more frightened than hurt. Only our precious meat portions lay covered in rubble and debris. Then, no sooner had we crawled into the straw after this ill omen than there was a pounding on the gate, and the alarming voice of the sergeant major got us out of our resting places in no time. First off, as always with these surprises, there was a moment of silence, then total confusion and din. My helmet! Where's my haversack? I can't get into my boots! You stole my ammunition. Shut up, August. In the end, we were all ready, and we marched off towards the station at Chamblay, from where a train took us, minutes later, to pagny sur moselle The next morning, we were climbing the hills in the Moselle, and stopped in Preny, a charming hill village, with the ruins of a chateau looming over it. Our barn, this time, turned out to be a stone construction filled with fragrant mountain hay, through its window slits we had a view over the wine-grown slopes of the Moselle, on to the little valley town of Pagny, which was regularly targeted by shells and aerial bombardment. 
Several times, shells landing in the river brought up vast columns of water. The balmy spring weather was enlivening and spurred us onto long walks in the wonderful hill country. So exuberant were we that we carried on larking about long into the evening before we finally settled to sleep. One much-loved prank was pouring water or coffee from a canteen into a snoring sleeper's mouth. On the evening of the 22nd of April, we marched out of Prenny and covered our twenty miles to the village of Hatton Chatel, without registering any foot soreness in spite of our heavy packs. We pitched camp in the woods on the right of the famous Grand Trench. All the indications were that we would be fighting in the morning. Bandage packs were issued, extra tins of beef, and signaling flags for the gunners. I sat up for a long time that night, in the foreboding eve of battle mood of which soldiers at all times have left report, on a tree stump clustered around with blue anemones before I crept over the ranks of my comrades to my tent. I had tangled dreams in which a principal role was played by a skull. In the morning, when I told Pripke about it, he said he hoped it was a French skull. Chapter 3. Les Eparges the tender green of young leaves shimmered in the flat light. We followed hidden, twisting paths toward a narrow gorge behind the front line. We had been told that the 76th was to attack after a bombardment of only 20 minutes and that we were to be held in reserve. On the dot of noon, our artillery launched into a furious bombardment that echoed and re-echoed through the wooded hollows. For the first time, we heard what was meant by the expression drum fire. We sat perched on our haversacks, idle and excited. A runner plunged through to the company commander. Brisk exchange. The three nearest trenches have fallen to us, and six field guns have been captured. Loud cheers rang out, a feeling of up and atom. At last, the longed-for order. In a long line, we moved forwards, towards the pattering of heavy rifle fire. It was getting serious. To the side of the forest path, dull thumps came down in a clump of firs, bringing down a rain of branches and soil. One nervous soldier threw himself to the ground, while his comrades laughed uneasily. Then, death's call slipped through the ranks. Ambulance men to the front. A little later, we passed the spot that had been hit. The casualties had already been removed. Bloody scraps of cloth and flesh had been left on bushes around the crater. A strange and dreadful sight that put me in mind of the butcher bird that spikes its prey on thorn bushes. Troops were advancing at the double along the Grand Trench. Casualties huddled by the roadside, whimpering for water. Prisoners carrying stretchers came panting back. Limbers clattered through fire at a gallop. On either side, shells spattered the soft ground. Heavy boughs came crashing down. A dead horse lay across the middle of the path, with giant wounds, its steaming entrails beside it. In among the great, bloody scenes there was a wild, unsuspected hilarity. A bearded reservist leaned against a tree. On you go now, boys. Frenchies on the run. We entered the battle-tramped realm of the infantrymen. The area around the jumping-off position had been deforested by shells. In the ripped-up no-man's land lay the victims of the attack, still facing the enemy. Their grey tunics barely stood out from the ground. A giant form with red, blood-spattered beard stared fixedly at the sky, his fingers clutching the spongy ground. A young man tossed in a shell crater, his features already yellow with his impending death. He seemed not to want to be looked at. He gave us a cross shrug and pulled his coat over his head and lay still. Our marching column broke up. Shells came continually hissing towards us in long, flat arcs. Lightnings whirled up the forest floor. The shrill toot of field artillery shells I had heard quite often, even before Arrainville. It didn't strike me as being particularly dangerous. The loose order in which our company now advanced over the broken field had something oddly calming about it. I thought privately that this baptism of fire business was actually far less dangerous than I'd expected. In a curious failure of comprehension, 
I looked alertly about me for possible targets for all this artillery fire, not, apparently, realizing that it was actually ourselves that the enemy gunners were trying for all they were worth to hit. Ambulance men! We had our first fatality. A shrapnel ball had ripped through Rifleman Stoker's carotid artery. Three packets of lint were sodden with blood in no time. In a matter of seconds, he had bled to death. Next to us, a couple of ordnance pieces loosed off shells, drawing more fire down on us from the enemy. An artillery lieutenant, who was in the vanguard, looking for wounded, was thrown to the ground by the column of steam that spurted in front of him. He got to his feet and made his way back with notable calm. We took him in with gleaming eyes. It was getting dark when we received orders to advance further. The way now led through dense undergrowth shot through by shells into an endless communication trench along which the French had dropped their packs as they ran. Approaching the village of Les Eparges, without having any troops in front of us, we were forced to hew defensive positions in solid rock. Finally, I slumped into a bush and fell asleep. At moments, half asleep, I was aware of artillery shells, ours or theirs, describing their ellipses in a trail of sparks. Come on, man, get up, we're moving out. I woke up in a dew-sodden grass. Through a stuttering swath of machine gun fire, we plunged back into our communication trench and moved to a position on the edge of the wood previously held by the French. A sweetish smell and a bundle hanging in the wire caught my attention. In the rising mist, I leaped out of the trench and found a shrunken French corpse. Flesh like moldering fish gleamed greenishly through splits in the shredded uniform. Turning around, I took a step back in horror. Next to me, a figure was crouched against a tree. It still had gleaming French leather harness, and on its back was a fully packed haversack, topped by a round mess tin. Empty eye sockets and a few strands of hair on the bluish-black skull indicated that the man was not among the living. There was another sitting down, slumped forward towards his feet, as though he had just collapsed. All around were dozens more, rotted, dried, stiffened into mummies, frozen in an eerie dance of death. The French must have spent months in the proximity of their fallen comrades without burying them. During the morning, the sun gradually pierced the fog and spread a pleasant warmth. After I had slept on the bottom of the trench for a while, curiosity impelled me to inspect the unoccupied trench we'd captured the day before. It was littered with great piles of provisions, ammunition, equipment, weapons, letters, and newspapers. The dugouts were like looted junk shops. In amongst it all were the bodies of the brave defenders, their guns still poking out through the shooting slits. A headless torso was jammed into some shot-up beams. Head and neck were gone. White cartilage gleamed out of reddish-black flesh. I found it difficult to fathom. Next to it, a very young man lay on his back, with glassy eyes and fists still aiming. A peculiar feeling, looking into dead, questioning eyes. A shudder that I never quite lost in the course of the war. His pockets had been turned inside out, and his empty wallet lay beside him. Unmolested by any fire, I strolled along the ravaged trench, it was the short, mid-morning lull that was often to be my only moment of respite on the battlefield. I used it to take a good look at everything. The unfamiliar weapons, the darkness of the dugouts, the colorful contents of the haversacks. It was all new and strange to me. I pocketed some French ammunition, undid a silky soft tarpaulin, and picked up a canteen wrapped in blue cloth, only to chuck it all away again a few steps further along. The sight of a beautiful striped shirt lying next to a ripped open officer's valise seduced me to strip off my uniform and get into some fresh linen. I relished the pleasant tickle of clean cloth against my skin. Thus kitted out, I looked for a sunny spot in the trench, sat down on the end of a beam, and with my bayonet opened a round can of meat for my breakfast. Then I lit my pipe and browsed through some of the many French magazines that lay scattered around, 
Some of them, as I saw from the dates, only sent to the trenches on the eve of Verdun. Not without a certain shudder, I remembered that during my breakfast I tried to unscrew a curious little contraption that I found lying at my feet in the trench, which for some reason I thought was a storm lantern. It wasn't until a lot later that it dawned on me that the thing I'd been fiddling around with was a live hand grenade. As conditions grew brighter, a German battery opened up from a stretch of woods just behind the trench. It didn't take long for the enemy to reply. Suddenly, I was struck by a mighty crash behind me, and saw a steep pillar of smoke rising. Still unfamiliar with the sounds of war, I was not able to distinguish the hisses and whistles and bangs of our own gunnery from the ripping crash of enemy shells, and hence to get a sense of the lines of engagement. Above all, I could not account for the way I seemed to be under fire from every side, so that the trajectories of the various shells were crisscrossing apparently aimlessly over the little warren of trenches where a few of us were holed up. This effect, for which I could see no cause, disquieted me and made me think. I still viewed the machinery of conflict with the eyes of an inexperienced recruit. The expressions of bellicosity seemed as distant and peculiar to me as events on another planet. This meant I was unafraid, Feeling myself to be invisible, I couldn't believe I was a target to anyone, much less that I might be hit. So, I returned to my unit. I surveyed the terrain in front of me with great indifference. In my pocket diary, I wrote down, a habit of mine later on as well, the times and the intensity of the bombardment. Towards noon, the artillery fire had increased to a kind of savage pounding dance. The flames lit around us incessantly, Black, white, and yellow clouds mingled. The shells with black smoke, which the old-timers called Americans, or coal boxes, ripped with incredible violence. And all the time the curious, canary-like twittering of dozens of fuses. With their cut-out shapes, in which the trapped air produced a flute-like trill, they drifted over the long surf of explosions, like ticking copper toy clocks or mechanical insects. The odd thing was that the little birds in the forest seemed quite untroubled by the myriad noise. They sat peaceably over the smoke in their battered boughs. In the short intervals of firing, we could even hear them singing happily or ardently to one another, if anything even inspired or encouraged by the dreadful noise on all sides. In the moments when the shelling was particularly heavy, the men called to each other to remain vigilant. In the stretch of trench that I could see, and out of whose walls great clumps of mud had already been knocked here and there, we were in complete readiness. Our rifles were unlocked in the shooting slits, and the riflemen were alertly eyeing the foreground. From time to time they checked to left and right to see whether we were still in contact, and they smiled when their eyes encountered those of comrades. I sat with a comrade on a bench cut into the clay wall of the trench. Once, the board of the shooting slit through which we were looking splintered, and a rifle bullet flew between our heads and buried itself in the clay. By and by, there were casualties. I had no way of knowing how things stood in other sectors of the labyrinthine trench, but the increasing frequency of the calls for ambulance men showed that the shelling was starting to take effect. From time to time, a figure hurried by with its head or neck or hand wrapped in fresh, clean and very visible bandages on its way to the rear. It was a matter of urgency to get the victim out of the way, because of the military superstition by which a trifling wound or hit, if not immediately dealt with, is certain to be followed by something rather worse. My comrade, Volunteer Kohl, kept up that North German sangfroid that might have been made for such a situation. He was chewing and squeezing on a cigar that refused to draw and apart from that, he looked rather sleepy. Nor did he allow himself to be upset when, suddenly, to the rear of us, there was a clattering as of a thousand rifles. It turned out that the intensity of the shelling had caused the wood to catch fire. Great tongues of flame climbed noisily up the tree trunks. While all this was going on, I suffered from a rather curious anxiety. I was envious of the old Lions of Perths, for their experience in the witch's cauldron, 
which I had missed out on through being away in Recouvrens. Therefore, each time the coal boxes came down, especially thick and fast in our neck of things, I would turn to Cole, who had been there, and ask, Hey, would you say this was like Perth's now? To my chagrin, he would reply each time with a casually dismissive gesture, Not by a long chalk. When the shelling had intensified to the extent that now our clay bench had started to sway with the impact of the black monsters, I yelled into his ear, Hey, is it like Perth's now? Cole was a conscientious soldier. He began by standing up, looked about himself carefully, and then roared back to my satisfaction, I think it's getting there. The reply filled me with a foolish delight, as it confirmed to me that this was my first proper battle. At that instant, a man popped up in the corner of our sector. Follow me left. We passed on the command and started along the smoke-filled position. The ration party had just arrived with the chow, and hundreds of unwanted mess tins sat and steamed on the breastwork. Who could think to eat now? A crowd of wounded men pushed past us with blood-soaked bandages, the excitement of the battle still etched on their pale faces. Up on the edge of the trench, stretcher after stretcher was swiftly lugged to the rear. The sense of being up against it began to take hold of us. Careful of my arm, mate. Come along, man. Keep up. I spotted Lieutenant Sanvos, rushing past the trench with distracted, staring eyes. A long white bandage trailing around his neck gave him a strangely ungainly appearance, which probably explains why just at that moment he reminded me of a duck. There was something dreamlike about the visions, terror in the guise of the absurd. Straight afterwards, we hurried past Colonel von Oppen, who had his hand in his tunic pocket and was issuing orders to his adjutant. Aha, so there is some organization and purpose behind all this. It flashed through my brain. The trench emerged into a stretch of wood. We stood irresolutely under huge beech trees. A lieutenant emerged from dense undergrowth and called to our longest-serving NCO. Have them fall out towards the sunset and then take up position. Report to me in the dugout by the clearing. Swearing, the NCO took over. We fell out in extended order and lay down expectantly in a series of flattish depressions that some predecessors of ours had scooped out of the ground. Our ribald conversations were suddenly cut off by a marrow freezing cry. Twenty yards behind us, clumps of earth whirled up out of a white cloud and smacked into the boughs. The crash echoed through the woods. Stricken eyes looked at each other. Bodies pressed themselves into the ground with a humbling sensation of powerlessness to do anything else. Explosion followed explosion. Choking gases drifted through the undergrowth. Smoke obscured the treetops. Trees and branches came crashing to the ground. Screams. We leaped up and ran blindly, chased by lightnings and crushing air pressure, from tree to tree, looking for cover. Skirting around giant tree trunks like frightened game. A dugout where many men had taken shelter, and which I too was running towards, took a direct hit that ripped up the planking and sent heavy timbers spinning through the air. Like a couple of squirrels having stones thrown at them, the NCO and I dodged panting around a huge beach. Quite mechanically, and spurred on by further explosions, I ran after my superior, who sometimes turned around and stared at me, wild-eyed, yelling, What in God's name are those things? What are they? Suddenly, there was a flash among the rootwork and a blow on the left thigh flung me to the ground. I thought I had been struck by a clump of earth, but the warm trickle of blood indicated that I'd been wounded. Later, I saw that a needle-sharp piece of shrapnel had given me a flesh wound, though my wallet had taken the brunt of it. The fine cut, which before slicing into the muscle, had split no fewer than nine thicknesses of stout leather, looked as though it might have been administered by a scalpel. I threw down my haversack and ran towards the trench we had come from. From all sides, wounded men were making tracks towards it from the shelled woods. The trench was appalling, choked with seriously wounded and dying men. A figure stripped to the waist, with ripped open back, leaned against the parapet. Another, with a triangular flap hanging off the back of his skull, emitted short, high-pitched screams. This was the home of the great god Pain. 
and for the first time I looked through a devilish chink into the depths of his realm, and fresh shells came down all the time. I lost my head completely. Ruthlessly, I barged past everyone on my path, before finally, having fallen back a few times in my haste, climbing out of the hellish crush of the trench to move more freely above. Like a bolting horse, I rushed through dense undergrowth, across paths and clearings, till I collapsed in a copse by the Grand Trench. It was already growing dark by the time a couple of stretcher-bearers who were looking for casualties came upon me. They picked me up on their stretcher and carried me back to their dressing station in a dugout covered with tree branches, where I spent the night pressed together with many other wounded men. An exhausted medic stood in the throng of groaning men, bandaging, injecting, and giving calm instructions. I pulled a dead man's coat over me and fell into a sleep that incipient fever lit with lurid dreams. Once, in the middle of the night, I awoke and saw the doctor still working by the light of the lamp. A Frenchman was screaming incessantly, and next to me a man growled, bloody Frenchies, never happy if they've not got something to moan about. And then I was asleep again. As I was being carried away the following morning, a splinter bored a hole through the stretcher canvas between my knees. Along with other wounded men, I was loaded onto one of the ambulance wagons that shuttled between the battlefield and the main dressing station. We galloped across the Grand Trench, which was still under heavy fire. Behind the grey canvas walls, we careered through the danger that accompanied us with giant stamping strides. On one of the stretchers on which, like loaves of bread into an oven, we had been pushed into the back of the cart, lay a comrade with a shot in his belly that occasioned him intense pain. He appealed to every one of us to finish him off with the ambulance men's pistol that hung in the wagon. No one answered. I was yet to experience the feeling where every jolt seems like a hammer blow on a bad injury. The chief dressing station was in a forest clearing. Long rows of straw had been laid out and covered with foliage. The stream of wounded was proof, if proof were needed, that a significant engagement was in progress. At the sight of the surgeon, who stood checking the roster in the bloody chaos, I once again had the impression, hard to describe, of seeing a man surrounded by elemental terror and anguish, studying the functioning of his organization with ant-like cold-bloodedness. Supplied with food and drink, and smoking a cigarette, I lay in the middle of a long line of wounded men on my spill of straw, in that mood which sets in when a test has been got through, if not exactly with flying colors, then still one way or another. A short snatch of conversation next to me gave me pause. What happened to you, comrade? I've been shot in the bladder. Is it very bad? Oh, that's not the problem. I can't stand it that I can't fight. Later that same morning, we were taken to the main collection point in the village church at St. Maurice. A hospital train was there, already getting up steam. We would be back in Germany in two days. From my bed on the train, I could see the fields just coming into spring. We were well looked after by a quiet fellow, a philosophy scholar in private life. The first thing he did for me was to take out his penknife and cut the boot off my foot. There are people who have a gift for tending others, and so it was with this man. Even seeing him reading a book by a nightlight made me feel better. The train took us to Heidelberg. At the sight of the Neckar slopes, wreathed with flowering cherry trees, I had a strong sense of having come home. What a beautiful country it was, and eminently worth our blood and our lives. Never before had I felt its charm so clearly. I had good and serious thoughts, and for the first time I sensed that this war was more than just a great adventure. The battle at Les Apages was my first. It was quite unlike what I had expected. I had taken part in a major engagement without having clapped eyes on a single living opponent. It wasn't until much later that I experienced the direct coming together, the climax of battle in the form of waves of attackers on an open field, which, for decisive, murderous moments, would break into the chaos and vacuity of the battlefield.